Well, after the introduction like that, I mean, I don't know if I should get up or sit down or go with my head. Um, do I have anywhere in my notes would ask? So it's amazing that when I talk to Kevin, I, I think and I say, um, if my sentence is going to have ask in it, I slow down. And I have been cursed with that. So now when I use the word ask, no matter where I am, when I get to that word, I know I'm going to say it. I'll slow down to make sure I have the sk in it. So I thank you for that. <laughs> my English teacher in Wednesdays, I kind of dread it because I just knew he was going to point something out. And it's just amazing what you gravitate to. And I just ask, ask, ask. You know, no one ever brought it to my attention but Kevin Patterson. So we're all grateful for Kevin, and he wants us to be better speakers and help us to proclaim God's gospel. So I want to say good evening to you all. If you're seeing me for the first time, my name is Andre Smith. And as we close out the lectureship, we do want to speak on the topic of woe to those who call our faith evil. Our faith, the faith, the faith that we put in Jesus Christ, it's our faith as Christians. So with the idea of Isaiah 520, Woe to those who call evil good and good evil, who put darkness for light and light for darkness, who put sweet, bitter for sweet and sweet for bitter. So we see that some people call this good or that good, but there's an opposition. And we're going to get into that tonight. I do want to start by saying I want to thank the elders here for the invitation to come out here to speak tonight during this lectureship. And I pray that God will enlighten them and help them with the wisdom as they oversee the congregation and their spiritual well-being. I also want to thank Brother Patterson here and his lovely family. And I pray that God will continue to bless him with wisdom as he leads the congregation in their spiritual growth. So I do appreciate him very much so. And we also want to thank him as an ex-student from the Florida School of Preaching and all that he does to help us to be better preachers and teachers. So with that being said, I want to thank you all as well. I want to thank you all for your faithfulness. I want to thank you all for standing up for the gospel of Jesus Christ. I want to thank you all for having the faith because we know and we understand that the world speaks against what we believe so strongly. So I know we have to endure so much as Christians, but let us not grow weary in well-doing. Because in due time, we will reap if we do not faint, according to the book of Galatians. So let us stay strong. With that, I want to bring about this idea of faith. Pistis in the Greek, and according to the Vines Expository Dictionary, is primarily a firm persuasion, a conviction based upon hearing, and is used in the New Testament always of faith of God and in Christ. Max Patterson, the father and brother of our preacher of the congregation, Kevin, says in his commentary, based on Ephesians chapter 4, 4 through 6, there's one body, there's one spirit, just as you were called to the one hope that belongs to your call. There's one Lord, there's one faith, there's one baptism, and there's one God, the father of all, who's over all and through all and in us all. And Max says the one faith Trust confidence, according to Hebrews 10.35, with the restrictive objective one, modifying faith. So there's only one, but we're going to see within the study that there's so many different religions. How do we get all these from one? Max says it becomes what we believe, the one message through which um, we trust Christ. The, this faith is the substance, it's the assurance and of things hoped for and the evidence, the conviction of things not seen. It has been said that our faith is anchored in the credibility of the biblical record. That's why our faith lies in, which is substantiated by ample evidence in itself, and we'll see that as well within the text. So I'm going to bring to you three important facts tonight. The first fact is, who is the originator of our faith? Hebrews chapter 12. Hebrews chapter 12, we'll be looking at the first two verses of Hebrews chapter 12. I hope you have your Bibles close to you, and you brought them with you, because you will be examining the scriptures tonight. Hebrews chapter 12, verse 1 and 2. Who is the originator of our faith? Hebrews chapter 12, verse 1. Therefore, since we are surrounded by so great cloud of witnesses, let us... Also lay aside every weight and sin which so closely cling so closely and let us run with endurance the race that is set before us. 
When we see, therefore, it's bringing back, the writer is bringing to our attention, the writer of the book of Hebrews, everything that was mentioned before, and we know in chapter 11, is the hall of faith, those who died in faith. So, verse 2, looking to Jesus, we look to Jesus who is the founder. Founder means the originator and perfecter of our faith, who for the joy that was set before him endured the cross. He endured the cross, despising the shame, and is seated at the right, the right hand of the throne of God. So he's our founder. This is something that we didn't come up with overnight in our own heads. We have a representative. We have an originator, if you will. We have someone that we look to for the faith, the faith that we hold so near and dear. That's why we endure, because he first endured it for us. Let's um, jump over to... Hebrews chapter 10. Hebrews chapter 10 with this idea of faith. Hebrews chapter 10. I'm sorry, Hebrews 11. 11. Hebrews 11 verse 6. Hebrews 11 verse 6 says, And without faith it is impossible to please him, for whoever would draw near to God must believe that he exists and that he rewards those who seek him. Without this faith that we hold so near and dear, without the faith that we trust in, it's impossible to please God. So when we go through the study, we'll see different religions or different people who call our faith evil. Really, they're in opposition with God because we trust in him. So faith is the only human attribute in the Bible which is mandated to please God the Father. And we have a great example of this. Enoch, according to Genesis 5.24, Enoch is known to walk with God. For about 300 years or so, he walked with God. And the LXX translated the Hebrew idiom, Enoch walked with God, with he pleased God. Not only did Enoch please God in the Old Testament, we're asked to do the same thing. Asked to do the same thing is to please God. And that's what we must do. Let's look at Matthew chapter 28. Matthew chapter 28, as we examine the scriptures tonight. Matthew 28, we'll be looking at verse 18. The originator of our faith, the faith. Matthew chapter 28. We'll be looking at verse 18 through 20. Matthew 28, verse 18 to 20. And Jesus came and said to them, this is his disciples with a great commission. Go therefore, and Jesus, sorry, Jesus came to them, all authority in heaven and earth has been given to me. So who's the originator of our faith? Jesus. Who has all authority? Jesus. On earth has been given to me, verse 19, go therefore. And make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit, teaching them. There's a lot of people that need to be taught what the truth is, according to the faith, teaching them to observe all that I have commanded. We didn't command them from our own intellect, our own mindset. No, Christ has given an order, a commission I commanded you, and behold, I am with you always to the end of the age. So we have the idea of manual, God with us. God is with us. He's saying, go baptize them. Well, in the Greek, it's baptizo, which means plunge, which means immersed, which means to go all the way in and come all the way up. Well, we have some of our denominational friends that think that baptism is just a sprinkling. Or just a repeat after me. Do you believe in, in Jesus? He died and he rose again on the third day. Well, with your faith and with your confession, you are saved. Go in peace. That's not what the text teaches us. That's not what the faith teaches us to do with the Great Commission. We're familiar with 2 Timothy chapter 3. And if we're not, it goes like this in verse 16. All scripture is breathed out by God inspired, breathe out, God breathe, and is profitable for teaching. Here's that word teaching again, for reproof, for correction, and for training in righteousness. So Paul the apostle writes to his son in the faith, Timothy, to help them understand that this is something that we must hold to. And the scripture is breathed out by God. It's not of our own, it's God's word that we help others to see, others to realize what the truth is. Turn with me, please, to 2 Peter. 
2 Peter, let's look at chapter 1. 2 Peter chapter 1. 2 Peter chapter 1. With this idea of who's the originator of this faith that we hold so near and dear. 2 Peter chapter 1. Verse 16. 2 Peter chapter 1 verse 16. For we did not follow cleverly devised myths when we made known to you. So Peter's writing to these Jews, this, these Christians who are being persecuted for the faith. But he's helping them understand that we did not follow cleverly devised myths when we made known to you the power for the coming of our Lord Jesus Christ. But we were eyewitnesses of his majesty. For when he received honor and glory from God the Father, and the voice was borne to him by the majestic glory, this is my beloved son, with whom I am well pleased. We ourselves heard this very voice born from heaven, for we were with him on the holy mountain, the mountain of transfiguration. And we have something more sure, the prophetic word that we hold right in our hands, the palm of our hands, to which you will do well to pay attention. As to the lamp shining in a dark place until the day dawns and the morning star rises in your heart. Watch this. Knowing this, first of all, that no prophecy of scripture comes from someone's own interpretation. For no prophecy was ever produced by the will of man, but by men spoke from God as they were carried along by the Holy Spirit. Well, there's a, a, a religion out there that says that a certain individual was in the woods at, the, at a young age, the age of 12 or 13, and he received a revelation from God. And then he came out of the woods after a certain period of time and repeated that revelation that he received from God by the name of Joseph Smith. And so he started a different religion apart from what God calls us to the one faith. And there's millions of followers. We all know what that religion is. If we don't, I'll help you understand. It's Mormons. It's Mormon religion. And here he comes out, um, and he comes out with a new revelation. But this is not what God has given him. We have the revelation. We have what we need to hold near and dear. It's right in the palm of our hand, the faith. This is of no man's private interpretation. But God has spoke. In Romans 10, 17, faith comes by hearing. Faith comes by hearing and hearing by the word of God. Not another man's revelation, but the word of God increases our faith. Literally, the message about Christ, the gospel, which is the good news. Hebrews chapter 10. Please turn with me to Hebrews chapter 10, verse 36. Hebrews 10, verse 36. We'll notice some things in Hebrews 10, verse 36. For you have no need, need of endurance so that when you have done the will of God, you may receive what is promised for yet a little while, and the coming one will come and will not delay. But my righteousness one, my righteous one, shall live by faith. The same Greek word we've been using for faith, and if he shrinks back, my soul has no pleasure in him. Listen to this. But we are not of those who shrink back and are destroyed. Those, the certain people who decide to do another thing, but of those who have faith and preserve their souls. Notice that there's a, a preserving here of our souls if we remain in the faith. We stick to the faith. So we see that we didn't come up with this on our own. This was, the originator was Christ Jesus. And Colossians 1, 18 tells us that Christ, the head of the body, created the church, which is his. So we rest in a faith that belongs to Christ, who is the head of the body, which we belong to, the church of Christ. So we saw fact one, who was the originator. Let's look at fact two. We must correct those who oppose our faith. There's a correction that needs to be done. And out of this one faith, why is there approximately 4,300 man-made religions? Out of one faith, according to Adherent.com, a non-religious organization that monitors world religions. But I want you to see this. 
And 35 different denominations profess to be Christians. 35 different denominations profess to be Christians. But we know this is not true. We have a huge problem in the world today, and it's called religion. They have no relationship with the originator of our faith, the faith. So either what they're doing is not right or what we're doing is not right. One of us have to be wrong. Well, if we stick to what the text says, guess what? We can rest assured in that one hope that we're doing the right thing, no matter what opposition comes our way. Turn me to Acts chapter 26. Acts chapter 26. I want to introduce you to someone in Acts chapter 26 we're all familiar with who's going to give a testimony of the fact that he tried to do away with the faith, actually the followers of the way. In Acts chapter 26, by the, a man by the name of the Apostle Paul, who used to be called Saul. We have to stand against those who oppose the faith. We're looking at Acts chapter 26, verse 4. My manner of life from my youth, spent from the beginning among my own nation and in Jerusalem, is known by all the Jews. So what he was doing was not hidden from anyone. They have known for a long time, if they are willing to testify, that according to the strictest party of our religion, I have lived as a Pharisee. Remember that word Pharisee, because we're going to get into that a little later. And now I stand here on trial because of my hope in the promise made by God to our fathers, to which our 12 tribes hope to attain as they earnestly worship night and day. And for this hope, I am accused by the Jews. O king, why is it thought incredible by any of you that God raises the dead? So here Paul is giving his, his testimony. He's on trial for being a follower of the way. But he said that you know how I used to live until God um, got his attention. Christ got his attention on the road to Damascus just a few verses up. But I want you to focus on verse 9. I myself was convinced that I ought to do many things in opposing the name of Jesus of Nazareth. So he said, I was convinced in my heart, in my mind, and all that I wanted to achieve in life was to oppose the name of Jesus of Nazareth. I did so in Jerusalem. I not only locked up many of the saints in prison after receiving authority from the chief priests, but when they were put to death, I cast my vote against them. Here is a strong man who brought opposition against the body of Christ. But can I tell you that this man wrote the majority of the New Testament? See, it's something about when God gets your attention, something about when you realize what the true faith is, what you truly believe and can stand on with full assurance because of the scriptures, the gospel. What a magnificent change. I myself am a part of that change because I was on the opposite scale of things and I obeyed the gospel late in life. The age of 29, I obeyed the gospel. I thought that Christians were sort of weak. That was my perception until I learned that weak or meek is just power under control. You relinquish your control and you give it to God. You see how I had to learn this from the scriptures which was taught not another religion with a different book of a new revelation, but the revelation I received from Christ. I love the gospel. I love the Bible because it helped me to understand that what I was doing wasn't correct. The apostle Paul understood what he was doing wasn't correct. On your own time, read a little further, but for the sake of time, we continue. Second Timothy chapter two. We must correct those who oppose the faith. Second Timothy Chapter 2. Second Timothy chapter 2. We'll be looking at verse 22. Second Timothy chapter 2. We'll be looking at verse 22 and following. So Paul would write to his young son in the faith, Timothy, and he would say, So flee youthful passions and pursue righteousness, faith, love, peace, along with those. Not everyone with those who call on the Lord from a pure heart. Can I tell you that these other religions, these other people that come against our faith, the faith, are not pure in heart. 
But he would tell Timothy to pursue with those who are pure in heart, have nothing to do with foolish, ignorant controversies. You know that they, that they breed squalls. Ignorant, literally unlightened. There's a lot of people who are unlightened according to the gospel of Jesus Christ. And the Lord's servant must not be quarrelsome, but kind to everyone, able to teach, patiently enduring evil, correcting his opponents. See, there's a correction that we must do to those who we know are coming against the faith, our faith, who are calling what we do evil, with gentleness. God may perhaps grant them repentance, leading to a knowledge of the truth. And they may come to their senses and escape from the snare of the devil after being captured by him to do his will. So the devil has got them entrapped in a web that they would not come to the faith. But that's where we come in as the body of Christ. In love, we must go to our denominational friends. So I often think of how many people in my family belong to the Lord's church? I hate to share this number with you, but I will. Besides myself, my wife, our children, one other one, my mother. Out of everyone in my family, they're all part of these different things I'm explaining to you. So they oppose the faith which I stand firm in. But can I tell you when my mother allowed me to baptize her because of my faith in Jesus Christ, it gave me a whole new direction that the gospel still saves. And those who are willing to come out of that other doctrine until the doctrine obey the gospel of Jesus Christ, glory to God. It's hard, but when we stand for the truth, it's going to bring opposition in our lives. But we don't bend, we don't break because we know without a shadow of a doubt that there's only one. It's not what others tell us about God. It's what we know for a fact as we study his word. So we see that Paul is encouraging Timothy to do this as well. Well, when we continue in our studies, let's go a step further. And let's look at Galatians chapter 1. Galatians chapter 1, we're speaking about we must stand against those who oppose the faith. Galatians chapter 1, we'll be looking at verse 6. Galatians 1 verse 6. Galatians 1 verse 6. Look at... Paul would write to these, these churches in Galatia. Verse 6. One who is taught the word must share all good things. One who is taught the word must share. I'm sorry, sorry. Galatians chapter 1, verse 6. I apologize. I know it didn't look right. Kevin, don't hold us against me. We're going to continue on. Galatians chapter 1, verse 6. I am astonished that you are so quickly deserting him who called you into the grace of Christ and turning to a different gospel. He's saying, I am amazed, not that there is another one, but there are some who trouble you and want to distort the gospel of Christ. But even if we or an angel from heaven should preach to you a gospel contrary to the one we preach to you, let him be accursed. Let him be judged accordingly, as we have said before, so now I say again, if anyone teaches a gospel contrary to the one you receive, let him be accursed. For am I now seeking the approval of men or of God? Or am I trying to please men? If I was still trying to please men, I would not be a servant of Christ. If anyone preaches or teaches or shares with us something contrary to what we know, what we hold near and dear, let him be accursed. We're going to get to that woe part soon. But we must stand for the truth. doesn't make a difference. This is the truth. We must stand on it. So in 1 Timothy 2, 4, God wants all people to be saved. That's why we stand for the truth and to come to the knowledge of the truth. And we have God's divine word to do this, which gives us instructions on how to worship God how to evangelize, how to love, and how to increase our faith. Also in the book of Timothy, it will say, fight the good fight of faith. So we see that um, God equips us through his word and how to stand firm on our faith according to Ephesians chapter 6, starting at verse 10, against man-made religions. And the world says that our faith is evil when God says, according to our faith, in Romans chapter 12, um, verse 1 and 2, 
to be in the world, but not of the world. We're in the world, yes, we live in the world, but not of the world, with their ideologies, with their thoughts, and what they perceive to be the truth when it brings opposition against God. We're not to get caught up in this worldly system of beliefs. They say our faith is evil because we stand true for baptism and what baptism really means. They say our faith is evil because we teach the truth regarding MDR, marriage, divorce, and remarriage. They say our faith is evil because we disagree with homosexuality. But God is love. God wants everyone to be happy. We stand against that. We disagree. We stand against lying. We stand against stealing, indulging in alcohol, adultery, fornication, etc. And the world considers our faith, the faith, not only evil, but judgmental. Because we stand for something. I have heard it said that if you don't stand for something, you'll fall for anything. And many are falling for anything, and we're going to see the woe that's going to be against them coming up. The fact three, judging upon all those who call our faith evil. So we see who is the originator of our faith, fact one. We see fact two, we must oppose those who come against our faith, those who oppose our faith. And so fact three is the judgment that's upon those. Woe to those man-made religions because they call our faith evil. They say, oh, we are wrong and they are in opposition against the true body of Christ. So this idea of woe between the Old and the New Testament is used multiple times. And we're going to speak about that as we begin to work our way towards the end of this, this lesson for tonight. So woe is a judgment. Woe is an exclamation of grief. And it's a judgment that God has pronounced on those who come against his truth. So Jesus says in Matthew 12, 30, that whoever is not with me is what? Against me. We're either on the right side with God, with our faith in Christ, who established our church. He's the head of it. Or we're against him. Let's look at Isaiah. Isaiah chapter 5. We'll look at a few verses regarding woe. And we'll move back to the New Testament. Isaiah Chapter 5. It's a proven fact that men, mankind cannot just do anything and God just lets it go that way. So in Isaiah chapter 5, we'll be looking at a couple verses, I believe 6 to be the number, starting at verse 8, Isaiah 5, verse 8. And look what the prophet Isaiah will write as the mouthpiece of God. Woe to those, not everyone, woe to those who join house to house who add field to field until there is no more room, and you are made to dwell alone in the midst of the land. Verse 11, woe to those, not everyone, who rise early in the morning that they may run after strong drink, who tarry late in the evening as wine inflames them. Woe to those who choose to do this. Verse 18, woe to those who draw iniquity with cords of falsehood, who draw sin as with cart ropes. 20. Woe to those who call evil good and good evil, who put darkness for light and light for darkness, who put bitter for sweet and sweet for bitter. Reversal of morality. Woe to those who are wise in their own eyes and shrewd in their own sight. The people who are ignorant, I'm sorry, arrogant. Woe to those who are heroes at drinking wine and valiant men in mixing strong drink. Unjust sentences passed on by, by judges who are being bribed and who are intoxicated. Woe to those. So we see that in the Old Testament, they get away with absolutely nothing. God is going to bring judgment and the prophet Isaiah is pronouncing judgment upon them. So we see within the scriptures. So according to Matthew, I'm sorry, John 12, 48, Guess what's going to judge us at the end of time? God's word. So it's not the catechism that's going to judge us, but the Bible. It's not the Quran, but the Bible. It's not the watchtower, but the Bible. And it's not the Book of Mormon, but the Bible. And it's not one L. Ron Hubbard, the founder of Scientology, is not going to judge us, but the Bible. Millions of followers all going in the wrong direction. That's not what's going to judge us at the end. If they don't know what this says, thus says the Lord, they're in big trouble. So 
before I come here, I drink some cold water, and all of a sudden my tooth starts to hurt. I said, it's going to be hard to come up here and preach with a hurting tooth, and I'm not in my area, so I can't go to my local dentist. Well, I stop at the convenience store around the corner, and when I go to open the door, it has a sign, be back in five minutes in prayer. So there was a lady sitting outside on the bench with a young son, and she said that he's praying. And I said to her, is he a Muslim? She said, yes, he's a Muslim. So he said, I have respect for all those who pray. I knew that she didn't understand what was truly going on, so I invited her here to, to worship with us. I said, um, if you're not doing anything, if you're not busy, because I was dressed like this, the sun said, and who are you? And I said, you know, I'm a preacher. I'm, I'm in town to preach at the lectureship at the Sebring Church of Christ. And he said, how far is that? Where is it? And I explained it to him. I said, would you like to join us? And would you two be my guest? She said, no, I have to go to bed early because I have an operation in the morning. So I asked her her name, and she said, well, do you? I said, okay, we'll, keep you, we'll lift you up in prayer. I'll lift you up in prayer. But you see how I try to bring her to come here to hear what God says according to his word, the gospel. It doesn't make a difference if I'm from Tarpon Springs. I'm here visiting. Yes, these are strangers. I'm not around this area, but still they need to hear the truth because it's the truth that's going to do what? Set them free. Well, we pray for her, Kathy, and, and all goes well with her and her operation tomorrow, but I kind of wish that she would have took me up on my word and came here tonight, that we could all meet her and she can see the love that's here within this congregation. Let's go to Matthew chapter 23. Jesus is going to pronounce a few woes as well, and this is to a religious body who are doing things the wrong way. In Matthew chapter 23. Matthew chapter 23. We'll be looking at verse 13 in Matthew chapter 23. We'll be looking at verse 13. And the word of God reads, But woe to you, scribes and Pharisees, hypocrites, for you shut the kingdom of heaven in people's faces. For you neither enter yourselves nor allow those who would enter to go in. Woe to you, scribes and Pharisees, hypocrites, for you travel across the sea and land to make a single proselyte, and when he becomes a proselyte, you make him twice as much as a child of hell as yourselves. Woe to you, blind guides who say, if anyone swears by the temple, it is nothing, but if anyone swears by the gold of the temple, he is bound by an oath. So we're continuing 23. Woe to you, scribes and Pharisees, hypocrites, for you tithe mint and dill and common and have neglected the weightier matters of the law, justice and mercy and faithfulness. These you ought to have done without neglecting the others. 25. Woe to you, scribes and Pharisees, hypocrites, for you clean the outside of the cup and the plate, but inside they are full of greed and self-indulgence. 27. Woe to you, scribes and Pharisees, hypocrites, for you are like whitewashed tombs, which outwardly appear beautiful, but within are full of dead people's bones and all uncleanness. 29. Woe to you, scribes and Pharisees, hypocrites, for you build the tombs of the prophets and decorate the monuments of the righteous. Look at these woes that Jesus pronounced on those who had the appearance to be doing the right thing on the outside, but inwardly they weren't rooted and grounded in the faith, the faith that comes with Jesus Christ. You hypocrites, you play actors, which is, it means in original language, you appear to be one way, but really you're another way. You see, God does not allow this to go on. There's judgment upon these individuals who are leading people astray. He said you make them twice um, twice in a way of, of bringing them to hell. You think you're doing them a favor. Really, you're doing the wrong thing. You're not doing it right. You're trying to convert someone, but you're not truly converted yourself. How's that going to play out for you? So before we close, I would like to combine a scripture that pertains to our faith and the woe. A judgment for those who refuse to obey God and the faith he established. 2 Thessalonians chapter 1. Let's close out with this. 2 Thessalonians chapter 1, verse 3. 2 Thessalonians 
chapter 1, verse 3. 2 Thessalonians chapter 1, verse 3. We ought always to give thanks to God for you, brothers, as a right because of your faith, in growing abundantly and the love of everyone for you, for one another is increasing. Therefore, we ourselves boast about you in the churches of God for your steadfastness and faith, in all your per persecutions and in the afflictions that you are enduring. So when other people rise up against the faith, the faith that we preach and, and teach within the Lord's body, the church of Christ, we have to encourage one another that we have to remain in the faith. It's a good thing where others are going to boast about it, that we're standing strong. But let's go on to verse 5. This is evidence of the righteous judgment of God, that you may be considered worthy of the kingdom of God, for which you are also suffering, since indeed God considers it just to repay with affliction those who afflict you and to grant relief to you who are afflicted as well as to us when the Lord Jesus is re revealed sorry, from heaven with his mighty angels in flaming fire inflicting vengeance on those, not everyone, but those who do not know God and on those who do not obey the gospel of our Lord Jesus Christ. They will suffer the punishment of eternal destruction away from the presence of our Lord and from the glory of his might. When he comes on that day to be glorified in his saints and to be marveled at among all who have believed because of our testimony to you was believed. To this end, we always pray for you that our God may make you worthy of his calling and may fulfill every resolve for good and every work of faith by his power so that the name of our Lord Jesus may be glorified in you and you in him according to the grace of our God and the Lord Jesus Christ. What a way to end out this lectureship. To woe to those who call our faith evil. So we see who's the originator is Jesus. As we trust in him, as we obey him, we place our faith in him from the hearing, the reading, the studying of his word increases our faith. We see that there are going to be some who oppose what we stand for, what we believe in, which is the truth according to the word. It's of no private interpretation, but it is breathed out by God according to 2 Timothy chapter 3. And we see the judgment that is upon all those who oppose us for what we stand for. So we don't have to create controversies. We know that we stand on the truth. We still love them. We're still gentle with them, but we don't give in to them. There was a gentleman who was baptized as a baby in Christ, and he started courting with a, a young lady, a part of our congregation. The lady comes from another religion. Well, he's courting with her, and, you know, and everything's working out apparently until he texts me. And he says, I'm not going to make it to service today. She invited me to her service, and, I, and I'm going to go. And I text him back, and I said, why wouldn't you make a stand for the truth and tell her to come where you are? Why do you need to go where she's going that she can prove that you really care for her? And so he went. And then he came to our service the following Sunday and, and Wednesday Bible study, and after a couple more weeks, he went again. So now I see there's a conflict, there's an opposition here. Are you trying to please mankind? Are you trying to please um, the female you're courting with and that you like? And that's all well and good. But if you're compromising the faith, your faith, you're coming upon the judgment that God did in purpose for your life. We have to stand for the truth. Buy the truth and sell it not. Because we were bought with a price. And because we were bought with a price, we have to hold this at high regard. High regard. It's worth that we can hear in that final day when we see Jesus, we can hear these words, well done, my good and faithful servant. And not the words that many will hear, you worker of iniquity, for I never knew you. It doesn't make a difference if we seem like we're the majority, the minority, we're really the majority. Why? Because First John says, greater is he that is in us than he that is of the world. So maybe you have to make that decision to obey the gospel for the first time. And it's something that needs to be done. 
There's no decision you'll ever make greater than that decision. I can speak for it myself, and many who have obeyed can do the same. It was the best thing that happened to me in my life. So imagine accepting Christ as my Lord and Savior, and a few years later going to the Florida School of Preaching with its intensity and with its subjects and with its studying and with the, 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 um, the sermons and with the manuscripts. And you must really love God and want to serve him wholeheartedly. I signed up for that. But first I had to accept Christ and what he has done for me. While I was yet a sinner, while we were yet sinners, Christ died for us. If you have to accept him tonight, we ask that you would do so as we begin to, to sing our song, or maybe you have accepted him. Maybe you have went astray. Maybe the other religions we're referring to, friends or maybe family of ours, persuaded us to go another direction because they were enticing, thinking that that was the truth. Maybe we went there and, and went there again and again. But we're back for a reason. Don't let that hold you back. Come back to the faith. The only faith is that's going to stand the test of time. It's worthy of all respect from the high authority given to us to preach the truth and to stand on the truth with these three facts in mind. Who's the originator? Stand against those who oppose it. And the third one is the judgment that comes to those who disregard what God says. Woe to those who call our faith evil. As we stand and sing, if you have to respond to the invitation that's going out, please don't hesitate. Thank you.